Con Sathopoulos and Josh Vegan come together in an incredible podcast, Grow, Scale, Master, an energetic approach to drive progress, master skills, build strengths, and put the strategy back into rapid business and personal success. Backed by real-world experience in rapid scale, to playing the long-term game of business, it's the story of all the lessons learned on the journey to mastery. Be inspired, renew your energy, and chase the future with Grow, Scale, Master. Con, there's a magical thing about you know, getting global perspective and there's a really great opportunity. We've had the chance now to work in the UK and the UAE and New Zealand and Australia. And, and you know, the interesting conversations that what I've worked out is, is that, you know, we are in a very mature industry yes. in that there's a lot of regulation. It's very clear about what the rules are. You know, when I travel to different states and territories versus other countries, you know, there's certain things that we can and can't say about price around auction and for sale and all of the above. And the interesting thing is it made me realise is that, you know, why do we keep on trying to play this industry as though it's our first time? As, as opposed to actually saying, well, hang on a second, we absolutely know what works. Let's do that core really well. And once we get to 10 out of 10 on those core, then we can then go and chase innovation. Yeah. But, but let's actually stick to the core. And what's really driven this to me is, is that, you know, our work specifically in the UAE is, is that respectfully to the UAE, it's a very immature industry in that literally it's finding out what it needs to do and w- what it needs to have in place and contracts and legal documentation, all of those things that are not in place as we had had in Australia from day one. Mm-hmm. And so this is that whole idea is, is that how important is it do you think that, you know, people have got to start to think, you know, what actually is the job role and what are the skills that that job role needs to master? Well, if like, you know, we spoke about vision earlier and we spoke about how we have exponential layered growth. If you don't have skill mastery by role and you haven't made it very clear about what you're actually trying to achieve, and I'm talking from the recruitment process to onboarding to, you know, you know, day one, week one to month one to month three and, and so on and so forth, um, it's going to make it a very difficult um it's going to be a challenge to be able to actually get to where you want to get to. So for me, I think the human nature of what we do in this industry is that everyone wants to kind of create their own story or choose their own adventure when realistically there are lots of, you know, um, you've got compliance and you've got friction points and whatnot, but the reality is it's the same thing that's repeated every single day over and over and over again. I think what we, um, what we need to be able to do as an industry is simplify it, nail the basics 100% of the time, and then re- rinse and repeat that as often as we possibly can. I know it sounds very simplistic, but if you don't have the right disciplines around attracting the right talent, making it really clear on what you're trying to achieve, making sure that they actually know what their role is, checking for kept competency. So really good example in our, in our business, um, our front office managers. Uh, what's really important is when you know people call in, we can you know take down details and whatnot. Um, do we actually check for competency around spelling and grammar? The short answer was no, the short, well, today we do, but now part of our recruitment and our onboarding is making sure that we're actually checking for those competencies so people know what the job entails and that they can actually do the job. Yeah, this is foundationally important, like the, the really simple idea, like you go into a cafe in the morning and they say, oh, lovely to see you. I just want to let you know I'm the waiter and um, today we've actually got a chef. And uh, also too, we've got a barista on the coffee machine and we've also then got someone else doing drinks. You will see someone else wander around who's actually going to be clearing the tables and all I do is I just take your order. Yeah. And then we've also got someone who's going to come and they're going to handle the billing and the payment. Yes. Um, just so that you're aware, that's how our cafe actually runs. Yeah. Now, now Con, I don't know about you, but if that happened to me, that would be quite weird. Yeah. But yet in residential real estate, like literally we kind of feel this over compulsion to have to explain to the consumer about what actually happens next because maybe we've built the whole persona that, you know, you're getting the Josh Vegan team in inverted commas yes. as opposed to Josh Vegan and team, you yeah, know, correct. which is the, the group of people that are actually going to be helped to facil- facilitate those experiences, but actually get really clear about what does this job role actually do. So when you think about it, um, you know, the industry's kind of gone through this era where it had people that were buyer's agents working inside of a personal team mm-hmm. and those people never, ever generated leads because they were just buyer's agents. That's how their brain thought about it. But yet the reality of it was that they're working with the largest lead source of the most number of consumers they are going to be future sellers, right? Yeah, correct. Absolutely. And you've got buyer sellers, you've got you know, buyers that are referrers, you've got buyers that are future sellers, but yeah, absolutely. Correct. So essential skill sets inside of a sales environment, you know, there's probably you know, a couple of different job roles. You've got the lead agent job role, which is about vision, prospect, list and sell. Yes. You've got a head of operations. Um, yes. Their job role is to manage the team, manage consumer experience, compliance, marketing, 
you know, vendor comms around everything around getting it logistically to market and through market and post market. And then you then move into the final component where then you've then got um, a, a co-agent who works inside of that team mm-hmm. whose job is to prospect, list and sell. Mm-hmm. And so that naturally then you start thinking about that and, you know, people get very tied up about the monetary side of stuff. But, you know, I want people prospecting, I want them listing, I want them selling outside of you. Yes. So then you can have a holiday. Yeah, absolutely. And, and most importantly, to be able to go and get scale and specialization in market and price points and type of clientele and all of the above. Con, what happens when we go to PM on this? Because one of the things that I think, you know, we have both witnessed in the property management environment is that there's something missing in the development of people inside of the property management business. I think that's because they're not run as sales businesses. I think they're run as property management businesses when in essential fact, we're, we're a real estate business. Whether they're a buyer or a seller, landlord or tenant, the behaviours, the actions around process in particular, the roles and responsibilities that you need, you need someone that's going to be responsible for compliance, someone for onboarding and new management, someone that can take care of routines, maintenance, you know, uh, outgoings, ingoings, etc. Someone that can actually lead the team in terms of being able to make sure that we're hitting our numbers in terms of arrears and, mm-hmm. and whatnot. But I, I think the, the short answer is, is we treat it like a different business. When mm-hmm. it, we're actually all in the same business dealing with the same people. There was um, a, a great diagram that um, was drawn to me once and it was like, you know, Josh, think about this, you know, past, present and future. What percentage of the day do you spend in each of those time zones? Mm. And I was like, oh, well, I guess it depends on a day. Maybe on a Sunday, I'm really reflective and I'm in the past, but maybe on Monday, I'm very energetic and I'm about the future. But maybe when I'm on stage, I'm very much in the now, you know, watching someone when they're on their phone in a training session, right? So, So the interesting conversation I look at there and I think inside of property management, out of all the training that a property manager receives in our industry, how much time is it about the perfection of the skill on how to do a great routine on how to really manage and run arrears, in how to get really good at onboarding a landlord, in getting really good at handing over a landlord about, you know, what it is that you do for an incoming and an outgoing tenant around entries and exits and and then understanding it versus how much of the training in industry is about, I don't know, conflict resolution, legislation requirements Compliance, yeah. and mental health stuff. Yeah, I think and I think that's it that's exactly where the opportunity lies is the same behaviours and actions that we've been discussing around, you know, the, 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 the role of a sales associate or a co-agent or an operations manager, we need to be able to transfer that down into the day-to-day uh, roles and responsibilities of a property manager to be able to actually check for competency, build out that skill set so we can do the best routine we can possibly do. So let me ask you a question for you, Con. In sales, mm. how much time in the training, percentage-wise, is spent on conflict resolution? Next to no time. <laughs> right. And how much is spent around current legislation? Very little. Well, it was CPD uh, points, right? Correct. Okay, great. And so then, and how much is spent on the mental health side of stuff? Yeah, a little bit there, but- um, Which is fine, right? Yeah, Which correct. is about um, understanding self and how we need correct. to operate in a new it's, world with digital. It's, it's all skills-based, uh, Josh. It's all skills-based. This is how we do a listing presentation. This is how we're going to prospect. Here's a buyer callback. Here's, here's a back. vendor price reduction. Yeah, here's yeah. how you do a door knock. This is auction day. Yeah. And so when you start thinking about it, like literally maybe when you start thinking about skill mastery by role, yeah. if you break out every job role in your business, You say, okay, great. Front of house, operations, uh, sales, property management, leasing, BDM, GM role, uh, marketing coordinator. You get the idea. You say, okay, great. What are the specific skills and, and attributes that would need to be had in every single one of these roles. And don't make this too big. Go, give me the top five key skills in each of those. And or maybe 10, whatever it would need to be. And then literally let's get a competency-based training program around Perfect. that. To say, okay, great. So, you know, if you're, I'm going to go and take a Karen or a Darren from Bunnings and how do I make them a phenomenal salesperson, marketing person, property manager in under 90 days around understanding the basic disciplines and the core parts of what that role actually really looks like. And I'm going to make sure that we've got a 90-day run through that every 90 days we're going to go back and you're going to be re-drilled again on how those things actually happen as a part of the conversation on this is what we do to do a great routine and this is what we do to do a great onboarding of a landlord and this is what we do on auction day to get a buyer to pay 10 grand more. I'm pretty sure you'd 90 days, you'd have a pretty phenomenal property management business or it's on its way to becoming one. Yeah. And this is a great sales business too, and a great marketing team and all of those. And so, you know, never, ever get away from the core. 
and too many people are over here on the extras and the icing because yes. they don't want to come back to the core of what it takes to become a great agent. Yeah. And I think that, you know, you drove that very hard in, um, in this year's training around, you know, let's just really make sure that the basics and the core is done really well. Yes. Until we've got everyone in the business doing 40 plus transactions a year. Correct. We're going to concentrate on what those core activities are. Correct. And really starting to think about teaching customer experience curves. So when you start thinking about it, it's okay, great. So what's the expectation, the experience that you would expect mm. that this consumer to be get, getting? So, you know, if they ring about a maintenance item, hey, look, I'll give you a call back within an hour um, to give you a resolve on where we're at with that. Even if it's not resolved, I'm so, still going to call you back in an hour and set that experience. So we call that in our business standards, mm -hmm. right? So what's the standard that we're setting? So I, I, my belief system today is going back to the cafe an analogy is that, you know, good customer service is expected. Mm. We're actually in the experience economy now. So how do we actually create wow moments? And I'm not talking about it's always got to be, you know, you know, uh, it's always got to be something positive. I'm talking about, you know, we've got a maintenance issue. How do we create a wow moment for that tenant to be able to be able to move on with their lives? Mm. So for us, it is all about setting those expectations and making sure that we can actually enhance the customer experience at every opportunity we get to touch them or interact with them. Does it frustrate you, Con, when someone says, oh yeah, no, no, that's what I did. Yes. So, so you, you, you do some training <laughs> with them. But why are we doing it? Yeah. yeah so, why so, are the results better? So, yeah. yeah. And, and so this has got that whole idea is that there's the role of the assessment in making people better, right? Absolutely. If you're not checking for competency, I mean, look, I said to our team of coaches in our business, when was the last time we actually heard where our sales associates do a buyer call back on a Monday? Mm-hmm. Do we actually know, does the lead agent actually know what they're actually saying or not saying or how they can't identify a qualifier buyer or a potential future seller? Mm. So for us, it's all about, I mean, we believe going back to, to layered and exponential, exponential growth, we've, we've had a bit of both, mainly exponential growth. Our business right now is at a level where we believe if we nail the basics 100% of the time, we have the opportunity to increase our standard wherever we can. We know that we're up for 30 to maybe 50% growth organically. And that's just doing the basics 100% of the time. So making sure when we do a buyer callback, it is the best buyer callback that that person can possibly ever do. But they can't have that opportunity if you haven't been assessing them, if you haven't been role playing, if you haven't given them the opportunity to be able to learn and develop and grow, right? But let's multiply that now through every single role in the business. And that's how you get that layered growth that becomes exponential because everyone's now pushing in the same direction. Connor, it's also too sometimes being able to challenge the status quo and the norm and say, imagine that the government made it illegal to do open home callbacks. Oh. How good would you have to be at the open house? Well, we did that, right? With COVID, mm -hmm. when COVID, you know, everything got put, you know, turned upside down. You can't do an open home. You can't do auctions on site. So we had to react. We had to act nimble. We had to actually be creative and we had to actually adopt some new thinkings and standards. And guess what happened? We, you know, some, some agents had the best time that they've ever had in their careers. Whereas others went to ground and really disappeared for, you know, six to 12 months, grew long hair and beards and whatnot, and then came back and it's a different, it's a different place, right? So, so, so now the, the opportunity in that is to say this, that do what you're doing so well in the moment so you don't have to do extra later on to recover. Perfectly said. Experiences that rapidly shaped you. Con, I'll never forget it. There was a book called Getting Things Done by David Allen. And in it, he had this diagram and says, um, so someone's coming to your world, can it be done in less than two minutes? And if the answer is yes, then just do it. Wow, yeah. If it's more than two minutes, then it's got to be a project and then it's got to be scheduled into the calendar for where it's appropriate. And then you've got to do work based on the appropriate environments that you're in. So if you're at the office in front of a computer, anything that's computer-based work, you've got to do while you're there. Mm. If you're in the car and you can make calls, then you make calls. Got it. So the whole foundational piece is that, you know, thinking about where you're at. And so if I'm at an, an awkward spot at an airport, that's a really good time to be able to make some calls or do some computer work. But if I'm naturally in a position that I'm driving, that's only call time. So it's about learning how to use that dead time really, really well. But it was a foundational idea to understand what actually is something that just needs to be done straight away. Yeah. Like what's that. something that needs to be put into a calendar and then contextually when and where. Yeah. So I'm actually really using my time really well so that outside of that, I can be better in my personal relationships at home, in family and all of those things. Yeah, I love that. So that's that AM, PM, right? So mm -hmm. AMs for prospecting, PMs for face-to-face. -face. It's having a kind of almost like a decision or a discipline matrix around when we do certain things, yeah? There's no doubt that like literally your job is to say, okay, great. If I can absolutely carve out my calendar so that the most important work for me gets done at the start of every day, and that's about creating opportunity and creating appointments, then it changes the entire way that I think about um, success because success in a day 
is getting my most important job out of the way at the start of the day. Yeah, completely agree. Um, speaking of talent, um, so w- one of the strategies that we've had is either acquiring talent through recruitment uh, or through mergers and acquisitions or growing it. And I think one of the, um, the, the most recent experiences that have kind of rapidly shaped our thinking has, can you do both and can you do both successfully? Uh, and I think as a real estate principal, um, I think you've always got to be recruiting talent. You've always got to be on the, uh, on the lookout for exceptional people. And uh, really interestingly, um, we've got um, a young gentleman that should be joining our business shortly that was working at Crown Casino. I spoke at a conference recently and met this young guy that's absolutely fantastic and would be brilliant in real estate. And now he's interested in being in real estate. There's talent absolutely everywhere. But the one key message that I said to this real estate group is the best talent is the one that's already sitting in the seats in your office. So for us, our strategy has always been about how can we attract, grow and retain the best talent and more importantly, how can we build the best talent? That's that skill set that we we're just talking about in terms of making it easy for them to be able to achieve their vision. Something that's changing your view. Yeah, the speed at which you can grow is so amazing. And, and really, there's the real power and clarity. And, and this is that whole idea that simple really wins in business. And, you know, we have a look at it all the time, Con, and I go, okay, great. You know, what's another 100,000, 500,000, million, two, three, four, five million dollar idea that you could be sitting on inside of your business today? Mm. And, and when I look at a lot of people, it's like, you know, there's real definition of average sale price or volume of transactions or getting fees up. But when you get clarity about that one number that you're going to go and spend the time on changing and dialing over the course of the next three, six, nine, 12 months, the results that come out of that can be absolutely phenomenal. I completely agree. I mean, there's a great book called The One Thing, right? Gary Keller from Keller Williams wrote it. And um, I think that kind of reminds me of our one thing, which was what's possible with Super Saturday. So Super Saturday was an idea that we actually worked on together, Mm. um, Josh, because uh, we're at a point in our first year where cash flow wasn't looking very healthy for April, May, and we needed settlements to be really strong in January and February. And we came up with a concept of running you know, 30 auctions on January the 30th and uh, that would be an auction event and we'd never done that many auctions on, on, on one day. We do that every weekend today or most weekends anyway and uh, it was a phenomenal ex- uh, a success where we got the whole team bought into a vision. They had the focus pre-Christmas to be able to li- list before Christmas, launch during the Christmas break, come back to open homes and activity and culminate that, culminate that with one day where we had, you know, 30 auctions. We did that for our first year. Our second year, we did 62. Our third year, we did 74. And this year, we did 130 auctions, on-site auctions in one day, uh, which was absolutely phenomenal. Listed 214 properties straight off the back of that, which held us into really good momentum and and, and energy for the balance of this year. It's been phenomenal. 